Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the technical forum here at the Hanover Fair at the group exhibit Hydrogen, Fuel Cells and Batteries. We are here at the Hanover Fair in the year of 2015. Every 15 minutes we'll have new presentations regarding the hydrogen industry. I invite you to come and have a seat. There are complimentary drinks. They're all in the house. We'll serve you with a lovely lady. Also, I invite our online guests all around the world. We are live streaming at this time. Our next topic will be high temperature membrane electrode assemblies from Advent Technologies. And for that, please welcome with me on stage the CTO of Advent Technologies, Mr. Emery De Castro. Big hands, please. Great, and thank you for that fine introduction. And I should welcome you all. Perhaps we should call this the Technical Cafe. Uh, so relax for this afternoon. And I'm pleased to be able to introduce Advent to you if you've not heard about us, talk a little bit about our technology and some very interesting applications of that technology. Uh, Advent Technology is actually the leader in high temperature membrane electrode assemblies. We have our corporate headquarters in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, we have our manufacturing pilot plant in Patras, Greece. Uh, and lastly, we have some research affiliations in Boston, uh, Massachusetts. Now, the high temperature membrane that is really the key to this technology began as a research project at the University of Patras in Greece. Uh, from there, it was found to have some unusual properties, withstood high temperature, stable in phosphoric acid, and when combined with electrodes, made a functioning high temperature membrane electrode assembly, operating roughly 160 to 180. And so that idea was actually spun out of the University of Patras, 2005 in Greece, called Advent Technologies SA, and then incorporated in the United States in 2006. Why would that be? Why was there even a market for that? Uh, what we have here is really a summary of the fuel cell space. The largest sphere to the left is low temperature PEM. Uh, as you can look around the fair, you can see it's, it's uh, probably one of the more advanced manufacturing technologies out there. You can easily make a roll good on the membrane. You can easily put an electrode against that. Scales well from the watts to hundreds of kilowatts. And widely accepted, except for the fact that you have to use high purity hydrogen and you need water. On the other side of this fuel cell map, there's very high temperature systems, molten carbonate, large scale solid oxide, medium scale solid oxide. And these work very well with impure hydrogen, especially if it's reformed hydrogen. These are best at the large scales, hundreds of kilowatts, megawatts. If you look in the center, there really is a gap. The gap is partially fulfilled by phosphoric acid, uh, operates high temperature, so it can run with impure hydrogen feeds. It actually, of all the phosphoric, of all the technologies in fuel cells, it's the only one warranted for 80,000 hours. So it's really the only stable electrolyte system out there, but very difficult to scale to the lower scales of say 100 kilowatts and under. And this is where high temperature PEM really meets its forte because it takes the manufacturing simplicity of the PEM with the electrolyte system of phosphoric acid and really gathers the best of both worlds. That's summarized here. So with low temperature PEM, uh, if you have reformed fuel, you need uh, to clean up the last of the CO to get that below 10 ppm. Then you need a water humidification or water management system. At high temperature PEM, all you really need is a simple reformer it goes directly to the high temperature PEM. These run without any additional water. In fact, the phosphoric acid itself is the conductive matrix here. Within the advent business, uh, we specialize in the membrane electrode assemblies. It's our customers that typically make stacks uh, and then incorporate those stacks into the system. So we're really an MEA provider. We actually have two, uh, two families of high temperature PEM today. Uh, they all both share the same characteristics. Uh, one, both based on advanced polymers and phosphoric acid, uh, operating between 160 and 180, which means high carbon monoxide tolerance between 1 and 3% CO. Uh, also, very good for sulfur tolerance, uh, 
typically up to uh, 1 to 10 ppm of sulfur. Not PPB, but PPM, so reversible at that level. And not mentioned much, but also just as important, and that is also robust to impurities that come in on the cathode from the air side. So cleaning up the air feed is not that important for a high temperature system. So I mentioned we have two families of products. One is the Advent TPS. This is based on a, pyramid, a pyridine polymer. The other is the Advent PBI MEAs. This was formerly known as the BSF 1100W. We've actually licensed that technology, which includes the architecture of the MEA, as well as the electrode coating process, which is very important. Uh, if you compare the two, the biggest difference is that the TPS uh, runs a little bit hotter, can go up to 200C. The TPS is a more rugged membrane, so it accepts differential pressure across there. Uh, the, the PBI MEA, on the other hand, has the highest acid content, proven lifetime of 20,000 hours. So now some details on the membrane. The TPS membrane gets its stability primarily uh, through this aromatic polyether bond shown in the upper part. This gives us thermal stability, chemical stability. To that polymer, we actually add uh, a pyridine group. It's this pyridine group that becomes the proton acceptor, basically a wick for the phosphoric acid, keeps it trapped within the membrane. At advent, we actually make this polymer, comes out as a powder, we process that into a membrane, and then imbibe that membrane with phosphoric acid. Now, the nice thing about having a nice stable membrane matrix is you can cross-link this matrix and even pull out more stability from there. So, uh, still considered a developmental product today, but we've been able to cross-link the TPS. And now, as you can see that, if you look at 5% uh, weight loss, that happens now at 450 degrees C. Uh, so push it out from 415. Uh, typically, we've shown this operating in our laboratories at 220C, and because of that, you get a boost in the voltage and conductivity as well. Now, if we look at the other side of the coin, the PBI membrane, it really is a, a different beast. It's made in a different way, it has different properties. So the PBI is actually based on an imidazole, and it actually starts from two monomers, which are then mixed into a reactive solvent called polyphosphoric acid. Uh, you heat that solution up, you form PBI in situ, and now the solvent of polyphosphoric acid, it's soluble in that. Uh, you can extrude it as a thick, viscous solution. You can extrude. Uh, then when you hydrolyze that, you actually get a phase change, and it goes from a soft, viscous solution to a very plastic-like gel. That's really shown here. So we start with our monomers, form the polymer, form a, a sole, we hydrolyze that, and now it becomes this plastic membrane. It's actually a phase change, which actually is good because it allows you to incorporate a very high level of phosphoric acid in a uniform matter, but it also defines the operating limit for this platform because you cannot go too hot. You'll start to shift it to the sole phase, and you can also not dehydrate it so much that you shift to polyphosphoric acid. The last link in the technology is called the gas diffusion electrode. This is then catalyst coating on the microporous layer. At Advent, we strongly believe this is the low-cost way to manufacture an MEA. If you can think of a stable substrate, a carbon cloth or a carbon paper, going through an applicator in a high-speed machine, laying down a catalyst coat, then from that roll, punch out the pieces you need to make the MEA, you can easily visualize a very low-cost, high-speed system to make MEAs. And so, uh, what Advent has done is actually licensed the GDE technology from BSF, which is a roll-to-roll -roll technology. Uh, when we think about these gas diffusion electrodes, they actually are the highest value part of the value chain in an MEA. While the membrane is critical, right? Without the membrane, you cannot have a good functioning MEA. Its job is pretty much limited, right? It, it allows a proton to be transferred and keeps stable between your anode and cathode gases from mixing. That's really its only function. A gas diffusion electrode has the catalyst, has a three-phase interface. So it really, in the end, determines your power and your, and your durability. And because these are precious metal catalysts, unlike my friends at Perihito, these are expensive, is really the highest cost component in the MEA. Uh, and so, again, with this license technology, we now have roll-to-roll -roll processing at Advent using very stable inks, uniform coatings, proven technology, and because of the high volume that has been manufactured using this technology, we can employ statistical process control 
on the gas diffusion electrodes so we know if it is good quality when we make the MEA. And that is shown here on the left, and I'll just kind of quickly go through the example. On the upper left is a polarization curve. Blue line represents the average of uh, over several hundred tests over uh, many thousand square meters of gas diffusion electrode for the cathode. The dotted lines represent your plus and minus three sigma. So this really represents the manufacturing capability of the process. Then when a new batch is made, uh, we can see here, what we do is we actually do not compare average to average, but we compare the variation of the manufactured batch to the variation of the unknown batch and compare then average minus two sigma to see if that is above our three sigma line from the manufactured batch. And in fact, what I'm showing you here is it would be a rebatch or a rejected batch because the variation was a little bit too high. Uh, and by doing that, you can assure of not releasing any bad batches to the MEA manufacturing line, which downstream then means that when our customers assemble their stacks, they're assured of 100% of the MEA is working when they assemble that stack. When you think about our next steps and our developmental path on the membrane side, the TPS, that's pretty much a fixed platform that today is made in a roll-to-roll -roll process. The 200X, is, which is what we're calling the cross-link product that operates even hotter, that's still made in batch today. And our next step is to transition that to a roll-to-roll -roll process that's ongoing. We expect that process to be simple. And then there's the PBI. Today, we actually purchase PBI from a third-party source. Uh, and so when that source uh, introduces innovations, we will then match the electrode to that and introduce that as a product. On the electrode side, there are really three areas that we are focused on. One is quality, the other is durability, and the final is cost. Uh, largely, last year, 2014, we focused just on the quality part, but really, more specifically, uh, marrying a BSF gas diffusion electrode, which came from the PBI system, to the Advent TPS membrane uh, in order to give it higher performance and higher quality. And the results are shown here. And so what you see in this polarization curve is the, the black bottom dotted line. That's the standard Advent TPS membrane and the traditional mem uh, electrode that was used for that platform. The, now the upper curve is the blue boxes. This is now TPS membrane with the gas diffusion electrode that originally came from the 1100W. And there are actually several facts here. One, which is not shown, is that the variation from MEA to MEA decreased as we expected. Uh, number two, the performance went up, which always hoped for. But more importantly, and also not shown in this plot, we decreased the precious metal loading by almost one half in using this P1100 style electrode. And so as it stands today now, uh, Advent is starting to make the gas diffusion electrodes using the BSF style. Okay, I'll conclude with these three examples of uh, nice applications where the high temperature really makes a difference. And so we'll start with hydrogen purification and separation. Now this is a little bit different. This is called electrochemical hydrogen separation. And instead of producing power, you actually apply power to a membrane electrode assembly. So it's essentially an electrolyzer. And on the left, on the anode side, you feed that what we call dirty hydrogen. It could be the, out, the output of an anode gas from a fuel cell but it uh, contains hydrogen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. You actually uh, oxidize the hydrogen. Uh, protons go through the high temperature membrane. You reduce those at the cathode, producing pure hydrogen. Since the solubility of the impurities, which is carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide in this case, is limited to the solubility in phosphoric acid, uh, it's very low. And if you can operate at very high currents, you can actually produce a high relative concentration of hydrogen compared to the small amount of impurities that would still come through the membrane. And so you can actually purify hydrogen using this electrolytic technique, starting with uh, impure hydrogen. Uh, the applications for this type of technology both spreads across fuel cells and industrial processes. Certainly if you think about a high temperature fuel cell like uh, solid oxide, molten carbonate, uh, at the anode, they certainly do produce hydrogen that has not been utilized in the anode, CO, CO2. You can then use electrochemical hydrogen separation to recover that hydrogen value. You can either sell that as a standalone hydrogen product, feed it back to your anode in your 
molten carbonate stack or solid oxide stack and get additional power, additional utilization of the hydrogen. Or you can store the hydrogen and then use that for additional power peaking if you needed additional power in your system. So that ability to recover the unused hydrogen from the anode gives you many, uh, many uses for that. Now the other part does not involve fuel cells, but actually is in the industrial processing. And the example I'd like to use here is metal processing, where there are many metals uh, where they start out, start out as oxides, they're in a furnace where they are reduced under hydrogen, uh, converted to their reduced form. The hydrogen, uh, because of the off-gassing of the metals, becomes impure. You can actually then clean that up with an electrochemical hydrogen separator and feed it back into your industrial process, saving on your hydrogen bill. Another example uh, comes out of uh, the fuel cells and hydrogen joint undertaking project. Uh, and it, this is a very clever one. This is called internal reforming for a methanol fuel cell. And so here the idea is to take a, a thin layer, basically make a methanol reformer in a thin layer, and put that juxtapose the anode of a high temperature MEA. And if you can operate this between 200 and 220 degrees C, you're at the perfect reforming temperature for methanol and then the hydrogen that's liberated can go right to the high temperature MEA. Uh, and so what this would do then is give us a more simplified portable power system, essentially in situ reforming right within the MEA confines. Uh, this program is ongoing and certainly uh, within our group we have a successful scale up of the MEAs operating at 220. We've shown continuous operating of the concept uh, to a thousand hours with no degradation and we're just starting our off on cycling tests. Of course, this is a very complex project. We have many partners uh, throughout the European community, uh, both not only in Greece, but in, in Germany with Fraunhofer, uh, and uh, in ZBT, uh, in Belgium as well. And so the, the work here is ongoing. Uh, the last example I'll leave you with has to do with space. And this is with the European Space Agency. And it's a very interesting concept, and that is for many of the satellites that are in space today, uh, they run off of solar cells. Yet there is a point for several hours when they go through basically an eclipse, they go through a dark side, and the batteries they have there because of the size and weight limitation are at their limit for capacity. They don't always have enough power to get you through those two hours in space. So the idea here is that during the light period to electrolyze water to high pressure hydrogen, high pressure oxygen, and then once it's in the dark period, feed that to a fuel cell. Now you may ask, why high temperature? Why not low temperature, right? Low temperature is proven, it's good. The issue is this. In space, the only way to get rid of excess heat is through the radiative process. You're radiating heat to a vacuum. So there's no way to use a fan or things of that nature to cool. And so a high temperature fuel cell operating at 180 gives you a smaller package, a lighter package to get rid of the excess heat to space. One key though for us, for our research group, is coming up with a lightweight, small volume cell, which means going to metal bipolar plates, certainly a challenge at these temperatures with phosphoric acid, but we've identified some potential hopefuls, uh, and we'll, those are being tested today. Uh, there's also some new design of bipolar and M plates, and we've actually shown the cooling concept that we propose in this to work uh, at the bench scale. And so right now we're going through a preliminary modeling to show that we're making the final total weight and power. So it's an ongoing program. And again, our partners here are, are limited to Greece, but certainly within the technical centers of Greece for this. So when we think about the Advent product portfolio, we really have two flavors of MEA, if you will. One is based on PBI, uh, polybenzylminazole. Uh, the other is based on TPS. The TPS is a very robust platform, uh, the highest operating temperature, PBI, certainly uh, uh, very high acid loading, proven lifetime, but we also now are selling gas diffusion electrodes because of our coating process and standalone membranes too. Uh, in conclusion, uh, it, it certainly is our opinion that the widespread adoption of fuel cells is really limited by hydrogen, hydrogen production, storage, and distribution. If you look around the fair, you can certainly see many great technologies for production, right? people working on that very hard but there still is distribution and storage that needs to be solved. If you have a fuel cell that can operate hot, you can then use impure hydrogen, which really becomes the bridge. So when I say impure hydrogen, something coming from natural gas, propane, butane, this becomes the bridge to our pure hydrogen economy. And 
and certainly by having that today, you can use the existing infrastructure for your energy. So advanced naval technology really combines the best in high temperature, this phosphoric acid electrolyte, and manufacturing cost or PEM style manufacturing. And with that, uh, I think we'll open the floor to the questions. And thank you all very much. I can open the forum now for any questions from the audience. Yeah. Uh. Thank you. Uh, how about the influence of CO to the MEA? Do you have? Mm. So today, uh, at operating uh, at up to 180C, we can take 3% CO. We've actually run up to 7%, but there certainly is a polarization loss at that point. At 200 to 220C, which is more our developmental product, that's uh, 5 to 7% is achievable. So you mean today is about 180 degree? Yes, okay. and 3% is easily achievable. Okay, thank you. That's percent, not PP, PPM, percent. <laughs> yes. Okay, all other questions can be taken to the booth. You can yeah. visit Mr. De Castro. Am Amory De Castro yeah. at booth number C38, C38. Which is right behind that wall. Yep, <laughs> just across. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Next talk will be in 20 minutes time about the quality issue of graphite bipolar plate production for fuel cells by um, the CEO of the Eisenhut GmbH and Co. KG, that will be at 4.40, 4.40. So we'll have a short break here and back here at 4.40 at the Technical Forum, here live at the Hydrogen Fuel Cells and Batteries exhibit. <laughs>